my uncle is a professional fisherman. And he That's actually, a cool job. right? Yeah. So like growing up, it was always yeah. We if you're were like a little fishing. boy too, you're like, yeah. this is what I'm gonna do. That's that was my plan. Was yeah. I was going to be Boba Gump. It's time for Pick Blast and Gym Class. This week, I'm joined by actor RJ Mitty, best known for playing Walter White Jr., a.k.a. Flynn, on TV's Breaking Bad. Born with cerebral palsy, RJ is also active in fighting for more representation of disability in media. So, RJ, will you give me... Well, you have kind of like a crazy origin story. Like, tell me, tell me, about, tell me about yourself, RJ. Yeah, well, um, so I grew up between Louisiana and Texas. Uh, I was born in Mississippi. Uh, both my parent, grandparents, when I was younger, kind of were a little sick growing up, so we were always traveling back and forth between Lafayette, Louisiana, and Austin, Texas, and nice. everywhere in between. And uh, my little sister was about one and a half years old, and she got discovered at a water park. An agent saw her and wanted her for a Luso ball campaign. At and one and a half. At one and a half. I mean... Like way to feel, way for me to feel unaccomplished. Like with somebody's like, right. killing it at one and a half. I'm, and I'm 12 like, years old, done <laughs> nothing. Here she comes in. Um, that is like the that is the essential little sister move. Actually, I am a little sister, and as yeah. a little sister, I know like we like we're just like more about me. <laughs> the love all gets sucked. Yeah, there. for sure. That's little we, sister. I'm syndrome. okay with that. You can you can have it. <laughs> Y'all can have and, it. But yeah, that's what brought us to LA, and uh, from there I started auditioning and acting and to meet kids my own age and then try and make money and turned into a career. Yeah, kind of turned into some stuff. Turned into you, some. Just some just some light stuff. So you did you did you want to be an actor growing up? Was that ever You know, that okay. was kind of I I never really thought of it as an option. I wasn't really like one of those things it's like I had so many other things that I was kind of doing and my uncle is a professional fisherman. And he That's actually, a cool job. Right? Yeah. So, like, growing up, it was always Yeah, we if you're, like, a little fishing. boy, too, you're like, yeah. this is what I'm going to do. That's, that was my plan, was yeah. I was going to be Bubba Gump. I was, like, well, that was the name <laughs> of the game. Um, <laughs> that was it. That was it. That was my view. That was my future. And here we are. Um, plans changed. Plans changed. But it's okay. And I, I, I like what I do now. And, you know, if it was an option then, which... The way that social media has changed it, it, it is options now. It's, anyone can get into it and has access to the industry. When the ICE first started, people didn't have access to yeah. it like they do now. And, uh, and I love it. Yeah, I mean, we live in a time where there's, like, a lot more options for inclusivity. And yeah. I know that, like, when you do a lot of interviews, you, we talk, you talk about that a lot. Um, and we're going to talk about it a little oh. bit here, too. But um, growing... So you grew up with cerebral palsy. Correct. Um, did, were you ever around anybody else that ever had CP or anything? I, I was and wasn't. Uh, mostly at physical therapy or at one of the therapist's office or at the doctor's office. I would see people. And even then, no one really, everyone was either felt horrible or didn't want to be there. So it was kind of like no one really yeah. talked with each other. Well, CP is so, like, there's such yeah. a spectrum. It's a massive spectrum. You yeah. either have zero or you have a hundred, and and there's so many things. And you know, a lot of people actually have CP but don't know they have CP. Yeah, I recently like, read something, and there's people that have CP though that also like they'll find out later in yeah. life, and so they just don't they, they never, just don't talk about it. Yeah, ever. And like a lot of people, I find a lot of people bury when they have something like CP or, or, or something that's like a staple or a thing. People will like, oh well, I. I mean, when I was a kid, or I that was like this. So they'll, they'll ha they won't admit it or own yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I always say disability has really bad marketing. Yeah. So like, if you like, get like if you get diagnosed with that, any sort of thing, like that's like yeah. labeled as a disability, you're like not me. Like that's. No. Mm -mm. I don't fit there, but it's everyone though. That's yeah. the one thing like I people need to be reminded is that like this makes us us. Like these. These things that come into our lives that change who we are as individuals, they, they make you you. And I find people kind of will alienate or ostracize something that they may be like, why does that person walk like that? Or yeah. why does that person talk like that? And luckily for me, I, I have very close-knit family. 
So it was everyone, and everyone's Cajun. So everyone <laughs> yeah. talks like that. That's what I figured. I'm like, I figure for you, you're like, I'm from the South. They're like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I don't hear an accent. You don't really have an accent. I don't hear an accent. Yeah. Like, that's one of my, that's one of the things when I hear people speaking certain languages, even like, not even just specifically like Cajun, but like any language, I don't hear an accent. I'm really poor with that. You're, well, maybe you're just very accepting and loving as a person. I or hope. maybe you're not paying attention. Or I'm just kidding. Probably not paying attention. <laughs> maybe it's the attention. It's the, I think it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Will you tell me? So when you moved, so you moved to LA for your little sister, yeah. the star. The star. <laughs> <laughs> the star of the show. Still is. Um, we. So how did the whole like Breaking Bad blew up? That became huge. What like did you just like answer a casting call? Like how did that even come to life? So. When I first started, uh, I knew nothing. I was not an actor, never trained. I grew up southern boy. Yeah, like you're going to be a fisherman. A fisherman. My, <laughs> my grandparents did philanthropy and stuff like that, but like I never really had that that way. And when she got casted, the, the, it was like, okay, well, let me set you up with a manager, and then let me set you up with an agent. And then that's what they did for her, and I just happened to be along the ride for that. And they're like, well... If you want to do this, you need to start getting on professional sets. You need to start going in and making that that step and hitting the auditions and, and going to the casting sessions and waiting and headshots and the whole nine yards. And that's what I did. And on top of that, pilot season came up and I started going out for pilots and one of them happened to be Breaking Bad. And I went in five times, uh, four in Los Angeles and once in New Mexico. And it just... They liked me, so they they got me. So is the character written with Sir? It was always that's was so always cool. Written. Yeah. So and what was funny is in the casting session, um, uh, Sharon Bradley and um, I, I don't remember if it was her or someone else, but they broke their like skiing, and they had crutches, and they're like, oh here, use these. And I use them in the shot because <laughs> I I wore AFOs. Yeah. I like so for me my physical therapy came down to occupational therapy, speech therapy, yeah. and physical Are, therapy. Is it all four limbs affected for you? Uh, all all four to a degree, primarily the left side. Okay. On top of like I may have I may have had a couple of heat strokes and like some other like some other injuries along the way. Yeah. I was always very active as a yeah. kid, so I was always being rushed to the hospital. Well, and when you were diagnosed with CP, did they do they ever like do they ever nail the moment when it happens, no. or did you have a stroke at birth, well, or does it? Well, so for me, what happened with my CP was the umbilical cord wrapped around my throat at childbirth. Um, I'm adopted. Um, not a lot of people know this, and I'm a closed adoption. It was very little information, and um, what ended up happening was, is my biological mother didn't have insurance, and my adoptive mother did have insurance. So when the insurance got confused, it showed her as an uninsured um, woman versus someone with insured, and that's last to be seen. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter um, how at risk they are, they're the last to be seen. Yeah. And from that, um, four days of labor later... Um, Good God. And, um, <laughs> and them losing me and her, that's what caused the cerebral palsy. Yeah. And then, because it was a closed adoption, no one knew about this. Yeah, so, because you don't really present until later. Well, because you don't present until later, and there were all the medical, my, all my medical records are completely sealed. Yeah. I'm sure, like through DNA, I could go find things, but um, but there you you don't get any records because it's the court ordered to shut it down. Yeah. Um, Dang. So three years later, I was diagnosed, and it was then actually through a doctor. It was it was it was through Shriners Hospital, but it was through one of the Shriners that was selling my mom, my grandmother, a Cadillac. They were selling. They're like, wait a second. And, and he looked at me and goes, "Oh, does your grandson have CP?" And my grandmother goes. Well, we don't really know what he has, but we know he has something. That's like such a southern thing. We're like, we're not sure yet, but he does walk a little. You know? He walked a little funny. A little off. Something's off. <laughs> but yeah, I was three, and then from three to fourteen, really was in um, karate and soccer and physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy. And then I did like a bunch of other different alternative therapies. Yeah. Um, well, and that's like the long, like for CP for the most part, PT is like. 
PT that's, is everything. That's for life, yeah. Like, that's for life. Like, yeah. it's always a battle, and it's like, it's always a disconnection of, of, of brain and body. And if you cannot always maintain control of your body, you lose. Yeah. And you losing means you're stuck in this. Life, yeah, <laughs> like, like, life gets exponentially worse yeah, very quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. It's like, it's like, anyone that's older, you ever been, like, saw them one month, and then you go back to Duncan and they'd be like, what happened? Like what? You're you're like do my exercises. <laughs> like, I I forgot to do my stretching today. That happens at PT is low key the worst. Oh, I mean horrible. it's the best, but it's the worst. It's horrible. Yeah. I, but I love it. But yeah, it. but it's also the worst. <laughs> it's like it's great. I hate it. I hate and it. And I don't like doing anything. Yeah. But thank. But, but God bless CP. God, God bless CP. God, God bless CP <laughs> and PT. Yes. Bless it all. Bless it all. So then, so so Breaking Bad. Yes. You got the part. It blew up. And then the series was over. And and then what? What was that transition like afterwards? Uh, good, you know, it, it's hard because there goes financial security, but at the same time, you have a lot more options. So I had a contract, and my contract would really stipulate on my work um, for what I was doing more on and growing my acting because they wanted to be like, yo, you, don't, you can't do this and you can't do that. So after that, I was able to kind of do a lot more um, projects and just more passion projects. Um, I think the hardest thing is not to fall into everything being a passion project, yeah. which. Well, they I feel like maybe do. with disability, like the world of disability is yeah. weird because it's becoming like we're we're doing we're doing a good job trying to get it more mainstream, yeah. but at the same time, still everything really is like yeah. passion. But they're like, ooh, our budget. We actually have a couple, a few mutual friends just through like the random disability community, and I know that you've done the runway of dreams yes. in Vegas. This was your second year. Yeah. Were you hosting it this year? I was. I hosted. I hosted in New York uh, this past September and then this year in Vegas. Well what was that like? It's amazing. Past years? It, it's amazing. You know, it, it's such a surreal thing to see. You know, I, I've been doing a lot of corporate advocacy on on uh, in, the importance of hiring people with disabilities and why we should have more things be adaptive and, and more the accessibility, not because of disability, but just having things accessible. Making things accessible, accessible. to the disability yeah. community has helped the world. world. Like even like, like thinking about on Facebook or yeah. even like Instagram, like now having subtitles, now we don't have to blast our sound at the airport. It, it simplifies it and it allows that. And people forget that this isn't just for one person, this is for everyone. Yeah. And that's what I really like about Runway Dreams and what Zappos Adaptive is doing is they're using it as a platform not just to address clothing that that people need but making it fashionable and something that people are like oh my god I want to wear this I like to wear this and you know not everyone needs the buttons or the the snaps or the shoes or whatever but like why do people want it People like convenience. People like convenience. <laughs> Whether you're disabled or not, like yeah. honestly, if there's a chair, it doesn't matter if you're disabled or not, everybody you're wants to sit down. Yep. <laughs> Who doesn't want to sit? Why stand when you can sit? That's what they're doing. It's, it's they're carrying that and they're putting it out there and going like, if you want it, this is here. Yeah. But the hardest thing I find is, and like it's funny because everyone screams it so much, is awareness, awareness, awareness. But... We have awareness. I think our next step right now is actually using the using it, using the product. It's like everyone downloaded the app. We all have the app. Yeah. But do you use the app? I'm like, is that app is that act, app actually functioning? Yeah. And that's where I think is the next, and it's always been the big gap. Well, and that's something really cool. I think that you've done because like your character on Breaking Bad, like it had it had depth. Like you yeah. weren't, it wasn't like, it wasn't just like this person that swings by and just like has a disability and their whole story yeah. is their disability and that's it. And I feel like right now, like there's almost like a schism because we're, we're breaking away from that. Yeah. Ki kind of, tell me, tell me your thoughts on that because I feel like you have much more insight than I, I do. Mean, I mean, well, I think we are breaking away from it, but I think it is like a schism and I think there's this duality of paths where it's like, Seeing it more and then having accurate representation are are both We're not bo <laughs> we're, we're not, not here. We're not quite but, here but, yet. But we're but we're we're along those paths and you have people on one or the other right now. Yeah. And I think this transcends 
every aspect of, of inclusivity and diversity because when people talk about diversity, a lot of people are only talking about one part of diversity. Yeah. They're not actually talking about being diverse. Actual diversity. Actual yeah. diversity. They're talking about, oh, no, my diversity. Yeah. And that's, and that's, I think, one of the aspects that we're going to have to overcome is this individual thinking versus globally thinking. Your colleague, Brian yeah. Cranston, was cast as a quadriplegic person in a wheelchair for a movie recently. Correct. Or I guess not that recently. It's time is on a spectrum. Anyways, yeah. um, time like cere cerebral palsy is on a spectrum. Everything's, yep. you know, it's fluid. Um, what, was, what was the response and what is your opinion on that when that all kind of came about? Man. We, Man. Got, we got time. Man. <laughs> um, you know, the response, the response was negative. But you know what's funny is that we're in 2019 and, and when this initially all happened back in 2011, um, that's when Brian got cast in. Which is crazy. This, like to that's... play this part. Uh, like it, it's I didn't been... realize movies took so long to make. Oh, I, I actually have a movie <laughs> coming up. It's been four years. We have one week of filming left. Oh, my God. That's and stressful. it's miserable. Yeah. <laughs> and you just want to get done with it. And I think that's kind of what happens with a lot of these projects. And, you know, it, it was disappointing um, to kind of see just... All of it, <laughs> like not not just not not necessarily the movie, but the people and everyone that just kind of like could have had a reasonable discussion about this and like why they felt this and actually got to the right individuals because they're listening. People are listening yeah. now, and instead it was a really a lot of yelling. And you know, I I back Brian. I I think he's a talented actor. I think he's great at what he does. I think he's he's a master of of his craft. And you know, there's no one in the world like Brian Cranston. Yeah. And there's no one in the world like Kevin Hart. And this cast, there, there was all one of a kind. And there was a reason why this became the number one movie in America. Yeah. <laughs> and you cannot <laughs> deny any of those things. And yes, they, they could have had someone that actually is paraplegic and that lives in that wheelchair, but it wouldn't have been made. That's what I, I never had a public opinion on it just because one, it's not my Every, place yeah. and everybody, too. Like, honestly, I was afraid of the backlash, even on Twitter. It was bad. But I thought about, I'm like, who would see a movie? That's, but again, like, this is, this is like a systemic problem. Because yeah. it's like, who would see a movie with an actor that nobody knows versus who would see a movie with Brian Cranston after everything? After everything. After 50 years. And, you know, there's not, there is someone that probably could have done it and extremely been, well and would have been amazing. Yeah. And this movie would have done so much, but it wouldn't have been the number one movie in yeah. America. Yeah. And that was my only opinion on it, is that without these people, it wouldn't have been what it was. And it's a shame to see, because I, I had this conversation um, and they, uh, with about um, Jamie Foxx playing um, Ray Charles. Mm -hmm. And they were talking, like, why couldn't they do that? And like, yeah, but again, that's Jamie Foxx. Like... Like that's a money. That's yeah, that's money. Yeah, he's gonna make money. And that's and that's what a lot of these things are based on. And sadly, that's what things get stuck on is can we afford it? How much are we gonna make? Yeah. Like what's our overhead? What's business. our underhead? And yeah. that's the business of it. And it's a shame to see that's the only business side of it. But that's again, this is a business, and our job is to to live in that realm and to make that work. And you know, when it came to the upside. I remember back at a uh, IMPWD committee me meeting, which is part of SAG-AFTRA, and uh, we had a, uh, an award show called Media Access Awards, and I remember when Brian got that part, and everyone lost it. And it then never saw the light of day, and they squished it, and they were like, they were, that's when they thought, they are like, you know what, we can bring it back out. And people are finally accepting, and a lot of people were, and a lot of people weren't. And I think finding that line and finding that ground and having people be able to say how they feel without yelling it. Yeah. Because, like, when I, I actually, I posted, I made a statement on Twitter and blah, blah, blah. I, I do I do remember and like, this now. And they, people, and were, like, I saw articles. Oh, people man. were really mad at you. People were so mad at me. <laughs> people were super mad. And, like, I'm like, I'm not going to even respond to half of them. And some I'm like, y'all are just missing everything. And yeah. it's, it's like, I get it. You don't understand that level of industry. 
or that level of financial banking or whatever it may be on on banking on actors because it's, yeah. it's it's that's that's it's what an they investment do. yeah and like, I I learned a lot I actually had the pleasure of hosting um, the Rio Paralympics I yes, was working I did want to talk about that I was working for GB did you get it oh you worked for GB I was working did AO, they fly man. down to Great Rio Britain, man. dude GB athletics dude, they kill it they honestly kill it. and like that's when I I learned a lot about how disappointed I am in our medical. Uh, or, or not medical into our own Paralympic. It's uh, not great. Community. No, it's, it's not, not great. Great Britain does an amazing job on like like the way they treat their athletes. The way they treat the, their just athletes. Just the NGB in general. The way yeah. that the way that they get them, the way that they move. Like y'all have to pay for your own everything, pretty much. Like there's very little scholarship. If you make a team, it's better, and it yeah. depends on the sport too. That's the thing. But but British athletics or GB because British athletics is just track and field. Yeah. But GB does like a really good job. They just do a they great do job treating job. both able-bodied and Paralympic yeah. athletes well. The um, exposure that they get, like, because I know you did Huge. stuff. Did you do Rio, the Rio Paralympics on their C4 channel? So, yeah, I was working for. Oh yeah, come on, girl. C4 is like the. Come I was on, like, girl. this is C4 like the cool where channel. It's at. Yeah, it's I, so cool. C4 is definitely where it's at. I loved working for them. I did. I've done quite a few shows for C4. What was your favorite sport to cover? I really liked watching um, judo and fencing. Um, fencing's really cool, actually. Fencing's yeah. really cool. Wheelchair fencing is gnarly. Yeah, I, I learned about it last year. I would like, like this is gonna sound horrible of me, but I would love for someone to take off the pads and give them real sabers and You're see like, what kill would them. happen. Like, <laughs> Just kill like, each other. What would like? Cause, like cause <laughs> Get your popcorn they're, out. <laughs> you, you, they're not. They're not moving. They're you're yeah. kinda, like you're wheeled in, so like you have to like get back, and they're pulling for the reaches. So I mean like. That's one fight to the death yeah. right there. That's aggressive. <laughs> like, super aggressive. But um, cycling was amazing. Um, you know, wheelchair basketball. I spent a lot of time on the courts watching yeah. wheelchair basketball. That was amazing. And cycling, hand cycling. Hannah Cockroft is pretty awesome. Hannah Cockroft is like a household name. Like she is like she is the, the staple of like. She is. We have Tatiana McFadden, but Ta- Tatiana is great. I watched her win yeah. like some some amazing win everything stuff. that everything, she did. Everything. Every. Her really? little sister was my sweet mate, and she oh, and I, really? yeah, she and I became good friends in Rio. Yeah. But but that's the sad thing is like you and I are talking about Tatiana like Serena Williams because she is a, yeah. like she is that equivalent in para sport, but for the majority of Americans have no idea, no idea no. who that is. No. No. Tati is the best. She's, Tati's awesome. Ah. Check her out. No, like the one thing I I loved about the Paralympics in particular versus the Olympics is the Olympics are are really really cool and they're great and they have the the best of the best of the world. But that's not the same as watching the best of best of human ability because that's what the Paralympics do. Is that they highlight? All right, we're going. We're made. Going to take something away from you, or we're going. You have this. All right, what can the human body do with that being removed, or that yeah. being added, or however that may be? And that, to me, is is what the Olympics and, and are really about, and the Paralympics are really about, is like showing that human ability to the top, and that's what the Paralympics do. Yeah, because. Some of these athletes that are in the Olympics could do it, and maybe they have an injury, and they may be going to the Paralympics. Some of them have complete mental breakdowns. Yeah. And like I can't do that. Yeah. And like it, it, it's like well, that, that's part of what makes an Olympian a great is that that mental stability and pressure and athlete, athleticism, to to to. The, to that be pinnacle, at the top, yeah. To be on goal, to be that first place, and I see more in I see more gold winners in Paralympics than I do in in Olympics. I see a lot of times I'll see people there. Yeah, I won the gold, but when I see someone on the Paralympics saying like I won the gold, they're like, I. It carries I won. a lot more. RJ Mitty, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. I'm thank so you. glad you stopped by. Me too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. This is Pick Last in Gym Class. Thank you for watching this week's episode. Head to dcpofficial.com to listen and subscribe to the Pick Last in Gym Class podcast where you can hear an extended conversation with RJ.